So welcome everybody, um, a really warm welcome to today's Global Cafe, where I'm delighted to say we have two guest speakers, so that's fantastic, um, both colleagues from the Netherlands, and I just want to remind you any questions, if you pop them in the chat or um, raise your hand at the end of each presentation, it would be great to hear your thoughts, comments and queries for our um, presenters. So. Our first presenter today is Yanyap Rinders, and Yanyap is a work and organisational psychologist who specialises in tasks shifting, interprofessional collaboration and interprofessional education. Yanyap has developed a meta model of interprofessional development, which connects psychosocial, professional, procedural and systemic aspects of interprofessional collaboration as part of an integrated care model. He also developed the extended professional identity theory, which describes how the formation of an interprofessional identity can be facilitated in order to enhance interprofessional collaboration. And this is what he's going to talk to us about in today's cafe, which is entitled Extended Interprofessional Identity Theory and Interprofessional Identity. So over to you, Jan Yap, and we can currently see the presenter's view. Okay, thank you very much for your introduction. Um, I'm going to share, yes, you can see this. I can see your presenter's view rather than the presentation. But if Ah, you... okay, so just a minute. Um, I'll maybe stop sharing then. Uh, so there it is, it be, and then slideshow yeah uh, yes now you can see it perfect thank you Yanya. over to you thank you Alison. um let me just rearrange yes so uh, uh so today uh we're going to talk about uh extended professional identity theory um uh, the APIT and Interprofessional Identity. This was uh, uh, developed in close collaboration with the uh, University of Groningen, um, the Hanse University of Applied Sciences, and the University Medical Center of Groningen. Uh, those are my uh, affiliations. Um, so to start with, um, it's all about learning, of course. Um, so what you learn is what you get. And if we talk about interprofessional collaboration, we talk about um, complex problems, shared problem domains, and we all have different perspectives. Uh, so I see what you don't see because of my identity. Uh, the way I look at the world, uh, my frame of reference, my priorities, and also my commitment to my own field of expertise is very precious. I have my own professional identity like any other uh, uh, professional, but we mostly commit to our own kind of profession and you commit to yours. And that's um, a problem, of course, because the, the patient or client is, is also a system. Um, but we do not always treat the patient as such. So from an identity perspective, professional identity aspect, as you can see here, you have on the left-hand side, a social identity formation, and on the right-hand side, social identity activation. Professional identity is a necessity because it's a source of motivation. It's uh, from a psychological point of view, it creates role clarity, but also commitment. And without commitment, there is no drive to become uh, better and you know to guide your professional behaviors so it's a necessity um, and it, it contributes to diversity also because you have different perspectives uh, your own professional uh, perspective adds to uh, to diversity on the right hand side however and that's the problem that there there is uh, uh, socially uh, no unity quite often in in practice and when we encounter one another we are trained in different ways. We have different uh, frames of reference, different priorities, different commitments. And this leads to misunderstanding, social hierarchy, and stereotyping. So this is, uh, uh, of course, a problem. At the same time, you need diversity, uh, but you also need unity. Um, 
and uh, in order to uh, overcome this, uh, in, in Groningen, we have worked on uh, a, a new theory, designed a new theory uh, based on uh, several different uh, theories from psychology. An interpersonal identity in this case should enhance unity and enable the diversity that is required because a mixed profession group can be compared with a toolbox and you cannot build a complex project um, without different kinds of tools in this case different kinds of expertise and information so what you see in this picture is uh, on the left hand side this is a representation of what uh, extended professional identity um, is trying to achieve we have a population of various professions if you can identify uh, high and low identifiers uh, you can measure interfessional identity uh, we can also uh, be selective and find out how um, whether um, individual interprofessional identities jointly will produce uh, more synergy within a mixed profession group so does your mindset and your commitment uh, really attributes to more effort, to more productivity, to more solutions to share problems and to less uh, hierarchical or uh, more reciprocal uh, communication styles? It's a joint style and output. Um, it's called extended professional identity theory, not because it is about professional identity, but it is because it's an extension. Um, it is an interprofessional identity theory, but it's extending with an additional and complementary social identity. Um, so I wanna uh, say a bit more about what, uh, from a psychological perspective, social identity is and how it can be possible to have two social identity uh, identities simultaneously. Uh, First of all, there, there are different uh, 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 theories and therefore also different uh, interprofessional identity measures because they have different propositions. And of course, every uh, theory is a representation of, of reality. You can try to explain your observations uh, and predict and, and, and change. Uh, so therefore, it's, it's very important to look on how you measure it and, and why uh, uh, this, uh, these differences are there. So here are, are three examples uh, within the middle. Uh, theory B um, uh, is, is a measurement instrument based on uh, extended professional identity theory, extended professional identity scale. On the left-hand side, theory A is the dual identity scale, um, which is related to uh, um, the framework of uh, dual identity formation. And on the right-hand side, you see uh, the interprofessional three-factor model of social identity scale. This is the work of, uh, of Tong, um, related to the work of, uh, of Cameron from 2004. Um, there are four differences when you compare these uh, three th uh, theories. Uh, first of all, dimensionality. So um, B and C are similar uh, with the number of identity dimensions uh, as part of this uh, identity. Um, what's also a difference is the role of attitudes. So from a psychological point of view, an attitude is not uh, uh, considered identity dimension, but an evaluation of a, of a subject, of a process, of, of people, of groups, uh, and that's positive or negative. So it really depends on your experience. Um, in, in theory A, it's considered an identity uh, uh, dimension in theory B, it's considered an antecedent uh, that when uh, it accumulates positive attitudes, it will positively influence any of those identity dimensions. Uh, another um, uh, difference is the integration of theories. So uh, theory C, for instance, is based on the work of uh, Cameron from 2004, a three-factor model of social identity. Um, um, the extended professional identity uh, theory is based on the integration of identity theory and social identity theory. And the dual identity scale is based on social identity theory and uh, integration with the contact theory, uh, the intergroup contact theory of uh, Alport from 1954. 
those are uh, very different. And this also means that there are different uh, implications. Sometimes there are different words used. Sometimes it really are uh, diverse uh, insights with regard to uh, whether uh, an, a, something is a dimension or something is part of uh, another construct. Um, according to, um, uh, to uh, APIT, Extended Professional Identity Theory, uh, the, there's a proposition that you have um, an integration of two theories where one uh, concerns diversity and the other uh, unity within that group. Uh, and these are two very distinct uh, fields of research within psychology, identity theory, is very uh, focused on intrapersonal identity, social identity processes, while social identity theory of Ty Fallon Turner uh, uh, is very much focused on uh, intergroup and interpersonal as a group member uh, uh, processes. So um, according to, uh, to APIT, you can have two uh, social identities and your profession, uh, specific professional identity is a source of motivation for your specific profession. So every individual from an identity theory perspective, every individual has many social identities. This has implications for the measurement and formation. At the same time, a social identity also creates unity and based on the principles of in-group favoritism from social identity theory, we can uh, create uh, more unity between professions. Well, if we look at identity theory, and many people have, uh, if every individual has many uh, psychological associations or identification with any kind of group or social category, but sometimes a social identity, uh, more than one is triggered, is activated within a certain context. And if this is so, then we have to make a choice. And we call this, uh, in identity theory, we call this identity hierarchy. And this is based on uh, uh, personal significance, uh, emotional importance of a certain social identity. As an individual, we are very unique. We do not have all the same uh, memberships. We do not have all the same uh, social identities. So we make a choice unless these social identities are in fact complementary. So if they are complementary, you don't have to make a choice uh, between social uh, uh, identities. In this case, uh, a professional identity and an interprofessional identity can be uh, complementary. Um, and of course, as, as, as uh, there's already a long tradition in interprofessional socialization, and it really matters within interprofessional education, but also in collaborative practice. However, we also found out in 2018 uh, where we first introduced the extended professional identity theory uh, that uh, uh, learning a mixed profession group is not always effective. We made uh, a, a double blind experiment. Uh, we designed this, uh, we published these data in, uh, in the European Journal of Work and Organizational Psychology. And where you can see in T0, in the pretest, is that in this case, this is about dental and dental hygiene students. In the Netherlands, they are two distinct professional groups. And you see that dental students, uh, there, there's more interprofessional hierarchy. Mostly uh, the topic control is by dental students. Uh, speech frequency is mostly at the side of the dental students and other dominant behaviors. We observed this, we quantified this, and, uh, and then we introduced uh, two conditions, randomly assignment of uh, mixed profession groups. And after the intervention, APID-based intervention, uh, we saw uh, an increase in the control group. So uh, it seems like a reinforcement of interprofessional hierarchy between those professions, while there was uh, a, a drastic decrease of, of hierarchical uh, behaviors, social hierarchical behaviors between those professions in the intervention, uh, intervention condition. So what is this uh, APID-based intervention? Um, it's a combination of, uh, of three uh, three factors, um, and it's based on, on the principles of social, ident uh, social uh, identification through socialization. Uh, the first one is, uh, uh, is a mixed profession group, of course, because that's how you build your, uh, your social environment is very much related to your social identity by enhancing entitativity or the perception of being a group. So 
you you feel that it's it's my own group and it's a social entity it's not just people waiting at the bus it's not a collection of individuals who are unrelated it's really it is a group and this is very important because otherwise if it's not an entity in our mind it's very difficult to to feel committed to have any kind of social emotional connection to it and social uh, emotional especially the emotional part of it is is vital for for uh, our motivational drive there it, it provides energy uh, which is uh, inherent to, uh, to motivation. The second part of it is is, uh, is a learning the group purpose. So we have to associate certain way of thinking and doing with this mixed profession group membership. And thirdly, uh, social contact, which uh, uh, creates more um, social emotional connectedness. And in psychology, this is also referred to as effective commitment. And this is the result of positive experiences and, and contact frequency. Duration is less important. Uh, contact duration is less important than contact frequency. So these, uh, these three uh, conditions, the combination of these three factors influence the formation of, of belonging, beliefs, and commitment. And these are also uh, uh, the subscales of uh, extended professional identity scale. This is uh, uh, the APID-based intervention. Um, and if we um, uh, use this APID-based uh, intervention also with other professions, in this case, mixed profession groups with uh, students from dietetics, visual therapy, and, and speech therapy, these are preliminary results of uh, Laurens van der Weert. Uh, then, then you see that contact frequency with a three-month uh, interval has a significant effect on the uh, uh, interprofessional identity formation. So the degree to which people feel an interprofessional belonging, uh, an interprofessional commitment, but also interprofessional beliefs. And those interprofessional beliefs are very uh, important to guide corresponding behaviors. And of course, we also uh, need to investigate that, um, those, those corresponding uh, behaviors, because that's what identity is all about. It's how you think, your mindset, your commitment, but also how, how do you behave. Uh, what we also found, this is an ongoing study of uh, Gabriel uh, Cantard. He's from uh, the University of Ghent in Belgium, uh, that a strong interprofessional identity is more resilient. So if you have uh, high identifiers, uh, they're less prone to, to um, increase their interprofessional identification after an APID-based intervention, while uh, people with a, with a low interprofessional identification um, they, they uh, after APID-based interventions, this uh, increases much more. However, we did find that uh, there are small significant steps in, in more in one of those identity dimensions of interprofessional identity, namely that in, in high identifiers group, people with uh, um, have small steps, but significant steps in an increase in, in interprofessional commitment. But we can always influence to some degree, even when we have high identifiers, we can uh, influence this. Um, this also seems that uh, uh, long-term strategies are required for interprofessional identity formation. Of course, the big question is also, will, uh, uh, when will interprofessional identity uh, lead to corresponding uh, actions? Um, activation of an interprofessional identity leads to action. Um, when considering the role of identity triggers. And these are cues that we have learned. So they are also part of our interprofessional competencies. If you have a strong interprofessional uh, identity, then it's more likely that you will show um, uh, corresponding behaviors, congruent behaviors, when an identity trigger is perceived to be relevant. And the more relevant it is, um, uh, the more uh, we will show uh, uh, behaviors or actions that are in line with interprofessional collaboration. Um, this is an, uh, uh, we did an experiment and we published this in medical education uh, last year, where we uh, randomly uh, assigned people with a, a, a strong versus weak interprofessional identity. We measured this with uh, eight uh, weeks before we uh, allocated them uh, to mixed profession groups. And uh, of course, we also measured the, uh, the difference 
um, between those groups with regard to the degree of international identification. And this was half a point on a five point scale. And as you can see, after introducing international assignments, um, international uh, uh, problems to solve, that um, even though there's a small difference between those uh, conditions, uh, between those mixed profession groups, that there are 5.1% uh, more solutions generated for shared problems, which is very promising. We also found that in the same study that people exchanged more. So uh, uh, there were more um, exchange, more uh, even uh, speech frequency, asking questions, uh, asking, but, not, uh, but also giving uh, advice and, and information. Um, so there was a more reciprocity between different professions in the mixed profession group. Of course, the question is, can we replicate this? This is very important. If you can replicate it, also if differences are bigger between those uh, two conditions, uh, strong versus weak, um, then uh, you might expect a higher percentage uh, of, uh, of solutions jointly generated for shared problem domains. And this is exactly what we found. This is a, uh, these are preliminary results of Ruth Kuipers from the Martini Hospital. Uh, he replicated this uh, and we have similar uh, results. Also, uh, strong interfessional identities within um, randomly assigned and mixed profession groups generate more solutions, in this case, almost 12% more. Uh, we also did uh, a research on, uh, uh, of course, in, in practice, because that's what we, uh, what we uh, are preparing for in international education. Um, on the left-hand side, this is, uh, there was a study among uh, dietitians and uh, physiotherapists, Dutch in the Netherlands. Uh, their international identities um, were also uh, related to primary care and secondary care. And then we can see that in primary care, uh, we see average lower, significant lower international identities. This is mostly explained by a lower um, one, a lower subscale, uh, lower interfessional commitment. So the social emotional connectedness in primary care seems to be lower, explaining this lower interfessional identity. Uh, on the right hand side, uh, this was a study in rehabilitation care. Uh, there we uh, saw uh, an increase of um, uh, interfessional identification, but also uh, improved group dynamics and uh, an improvement of efficiency with 10 to 15% which uh, represents uh, an average of 11.8 uh, inpatient days decreased. So people, while maintaining the same quality of care, people could go home uh, much uh, sooner. Um, so to end this, uh, uh, this presentation, um, IPE uh, can play a very uh, important and does already play, of course, a very important role in the contribution to change, because we need uh, change and we need, of course, to move towards a more interprofessional world. Um, if we introduce long-term uh, uh, strategies um, to, to enhance interprofessional identity formation, uh, besides, of course, also working on interprofessional uh, competency development, we can really uh, make a difference and we can turn minority into a majority and based on uh, psychological threshold models. Uh, this is also um, um, a very uh, interesting uh, to observe this if we can really uh, enhance this change on, on a more societal uh, level. So um, professional identity is a self-perception as a committed interprofessional member of a mixed profession community. Uh, and uh, interprofessional education is of vital importance for practice to, uh, to enhance this and to uh, be better together. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, so far, this was my presentation about the extent of professional identity, theory, APIT, and interprofessional identity. Thank you so much, Yanya. That was incredible. My question is, do you ever sleep?
because <laughs> you are you're so busy there's so much um that you've done over recent times and uh and you continue to do which is brilliant i'm just trying to change the so we can see each other yeah and what, what you continue to do and all of these projects that you're still engaged with it's just incredible and we're on a global scale we're really grateful for the work that you do so thank you so much and does anyone have a question i can see mike is waving his hand mike oh no he's just clapping yeah <laughs> <laughs> which is nice does anyone have a question for uh yan yap or are you as uh, impressed and overwhelmed as i am <laughs> i hope it was uh, it wasn't too much no, it, it was incredible. Yeah, there was a lot of information to take on board, wasn't it? And that's why it's great that we can share the recording of today. Um, so <clears throat> Dr. Crystal Gaddy has said, thank you. I appreciate this research, development of a model and framework and the work you continue to do. And also um, Dr. Jure has said, thank you very much as well. So um, yeah, I think we're all going to reflect and um yeah, take this all on board. And uh, it may be that people uh, contact you after the event. And somebody else so excited to go out on IP.G Global Digital Channels, and that's obviously Jodi, our tech guru. So Dr. Crystal has their hand up if you'd like to pop your mic on. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Awesome. Thank you. I am just so excited about this because um, really I'm beginning to grow more in this global um, into professional um, phase. And my question, um, as I teach, because I do teach IPP with our occupational therapists, um, we connect with the physician assistants and nursing um, departments and do great interprofessional work. Of course, just like any interprofessional work, I feel like the um, the barriers that we do have, of course, is the time and when to get together. Um, one thing that I did have a question is, when it comes to the multi-professional or um, like multi-professional learning where professions in a um, university or pre-health phase are learning kind of the same information along with one another, um, how, how does that really help to, to increase that, um, that unity? Um, that you're you're stating that does sometimes decrease when there's multiple professions trying to work together. How soon should you actually say we should begin to incorporate that as we're teaching our um, in in pre health programs? And thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, for your interesting question. Uh, very relevant. Uh, um, yeah the, uh, so uh, if i understand you correctly there there uh, there there's a timing and there's uh, moving towards uh, or maybe the effect of multi versus interprofessional uh, education yes yeah so yeah, uh, um, yeah. well f first of all um, um, with regard to multiprofessional um, um, education um, the mindset the association with the group's purpose. So if you if you belong to a especially small mixed uh, uh, profession group, um, it's it's in a small mixed profession uh, group. It's more easy to get a stronger social cohesion in a in a shorter time, and this can uh, uh, be reflected in the in the uh, individual commitments to this mixed profession group. Uh, however, uh, the the mindset. So those interprofessional beliefs uh, should be connected to this group membership. And if not, um, then you can still, uh, you can also develop kind of a, a multi-professional uh, uh, identity. So that, so that would be, uh, would also possibly uh, ex explain uh, this. So this, this mindset um, will guide, uh, will determine uh, the orientation of behavior. So uh, I think um, uh, um, you can use uh, efficient uh, multi-professional um, ed education uh, if it's if it's more efficient. Uh, however, I, I I do believe that it is uh, it is good to have the mindset before that. Uh, so so that's that's a matter of of, of timing. Um, a more uh, comprehensive uh, part of this, a more uh, uh, tricky 
part of this, uh, I, I can show you uh, this slide. <laughs> um, it, it, based on uh, on APIT, we, uh, what you can see here may be uh, a bit uh, a busy picture. <laughs> but, uh, um, at one uh, at one you have uh, the patient, uh, and three A is the professional identity of the individual below, and three B is the interprofessional identity of the individual below. So this has relation with regard to uh, motivation, either to professional action on the left-hand side or interprofessional action to the right-hand side. Uh, and the degree of, uh, of uh, uh, quality of action is more competency-based. Uh, if it's professional, it's more, it's 4A. If it's interprofessional, it's 4B. So um, um, there is, uh, uh, as you can see, there there is a connection between three A and three B. So uh, uh, we have informal data; <laughs> it's not official, <laughs> but it's in, in, in. We have an informal confirmation that if you uh, that it is good to uh, first overcome uh, auto stereotypical thinking, profession based. Um, uh, also, that if you even discuss isolated, in an isolated single profession setting, discuss what the added value of interprofessional collaboration is, it can already, and you do this in, 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 in small single profession groups, people can influence and get motivated for interprofessional collaboration without having uh, a very strong interprofessional identity. However, we did saw, uh, see a change in one dimension as we expected, and that was in the dimension of interprofessional belonging, which is an inclusion dimension of the interprofessional identity as a social identity. So, uh, um, um, and this is uh, very much in line uh, with uh, anticipatory socialization process as, as described all in, in, in psychological studies. So uh, I, I think it's very exciting. There, there's still a lot to know. And this is, uh, uh, we, we are um, uh, preparing a study to, to further, uh, to reconfirm this um, because we just, it, yeah, well, it, it was a formal, it was not a formal study. Thank you so much, Thank Janja. You. I, I think we could probably talk all day um, about your presentation. Uh, but Hester is waiting in the wings, and so I'm going to say thank you so much. There are more questions in the chat if you want to have a look at them. Time permitting, at the end, we can we can come back to you. Mike, um, Mike are you okay to wait until the end? Fantastic. Thank you so much, Janja. So I'm going to unpin you, otherwise we'll be looking at you. <laughs> right remove pen okay so um, i'm now going to introduce you to hester smeets and hester is a health scientist who works at zoid university of applied sciences i hope i've said that right hester and she's also the project leader of the revision of interprofessional education at that university she also works as a researcher in interprofessional collaboration at an organization for childcare and social work in 2018, Hester started with a PhD, which focused on the assessment of interprofessional competencies in higher healthcare education. Now her dissertation is finished, so huge congratulations for that, Hester. What an Thank you. Um, you're now looking forward to sharing your findings with our community here today and also via the recording. So Hester's presentation is entitled Beyond the Silos, Design Guidelines for Interprofessional Assessment in Higher Healthcare Education. So, Hester, if you'd like to share your screen, please. Yes, let me see whether I now have the right screen. I think so. Absolutely perfect. So I will you. Uh, pin you so we can watch and uh, please start when you're ready. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Alison, and thank you, Yanya, for your presentation. Uh, as Alison said, my name is Hastel Smeets, uh, and where Jan Jaap is from the very north of the Netherlands, I'm from the very south of the Netherlands. I work at Zuid University, almost correct uh, pronunciation, and Maastricht University, um, and I did my PhD project in the last, uh, last few years. 
regarding assessment of interprofessional education. Let's see if this works. Yeah, so I, I'm sure I don't have to explain very much to you about the importance of interprofessional collaboration, but we know that it's very important, interprofessional collaboration within care and well-being. And as we know, we cannot expect future professionals to collaborate naturally. It's highly complex and they must be trained in interprofessional education. So students must learn to recognize what they can contribute to care and well-being, who the other players in this field are and how they can work together to meet the needs of the clients, the residents, citizens, etc. So there is increasing knowledge about interprofessional education where students from various programs learn about, from and with each other to improve their collaboration. However, we still know very little about how to assess this interprofessional education and their interprofessional competencies. So what guides students in their development in interprofessional collaboration and how can we assess whether students can work together? So how can we make decisions about students' interprofessional competencies? So therefore, we started this PhD project um, with the aim uh, that was to identify the characteristics. Oh, whoops the characteristics of and requirements for assessments to make valid decisions about students' interprofessional competencies in higher healthcare education. To answer this question, four consecutive studies in three phases, the analysis, design and validation and impact evaluation uh, were conducted, which I will now walk you through. I don't think I have time to share all the results with you, but please feel free to ask for my uh, for my dissertation, which I will then send you in September. So the first study was a scoping review in which we searched existing literature to see what's already known about the assessment of interprofessional collaboration. We specifically looked at performance assessments where students actively engage in interprofessional collaboration, so practicing it in real exercises. The literature revealed that a fair amount is known about certain aspects of assessments, such as the various sub-competencies important in interprofessional collaboration, like you all know, from example, the IPAC competency framework, like communication among students, do they understand each other, do they use their own language? There were also many instruments used to assess students, like checklists or rubrics. It was notable, however, that often these same instruments were used in many different settings. So for example, one questionnaire could be used to evaluate professionals' knowledge in a practice setting, for example, a hospital, as well as it was used in education to assess first year students. Moreover, little was known about the relationship between different aspects of the assessment. So the alignment between the different aspects of the assessment. What is the construct of the assessment, the competencies, how a task was designed to elicit behavior in student, what product or processes were assessed, and what instruments were used uh, to translate the student behavior into a grade or a pass or fail decision. With this QR code, I hope it works, but you can scan that to uh, get to the article with the scoping review. But if you didn't have the time, please ask me and I, uh, I'm happy to share it with you. So we found in the scoping review that there were no guidelines for designing interprofessional assessment. So we tackled this in the second study. In the second study, five expert groups reached a consensus on guidelines to design interprofessional assessments in higher healthcare education. We did this using a nominal group technique. And the three experts group were patients, uh, the, the five expert groups, sorry, patients, students, teachers, experts in interprofessional education and educational scientists. And we had uh, three rounds, let's say, to reach consensus with these experts, an intra-group consensus session, an inter-group consensus session, and a member check. Here again, a QR code to the article. But eventually, 26 guidelines were formulated for the design of the assessment task the composition of the group of assessors in interprofessional education and the assessment procedure. For the assessment task, it was important, for example, to use authentic tasks in interprofessional education and to assess a combination 
of assessment products and processes. And one student said that I think that the writing that we now have in almost every assessment task regarding collaboration does not match into professional practice. So at the moment, it doesn't seem very authentic. Regarding assessors, it was important that they had experience with interprofessional collaboration and practice and that patients were involved in the assessment if they felt competent to do so. This patient, for example, said that I can contribute to the education and share my story, but I never see the students' reports and I have no say in the assessment. I think that's very odd. The guidelines for the assessment procedures highlighted the importance of designing the assessment to assess both the individual student and the entire team of students, whereas now most focus is on uh, the individual students in interprofessional assessment or education. So in the next studies, studies three and four, we redesigned an assessment already used in interprofessional education at Zuid University of Applied Sciences in the second year. I'm hoping that you can still see my screen. Oh yeah, I see you nodding. I thought something went wrong. Yeah, good. Um, so yeah, we redesigned an assessment task that was used at Zuid, my university, uh, in the second year of student educational programs. And the students participating in this education, and so for whom the assessment was intended, came from the programs Occupational Therapy, uh, Speech Therapy, Physiotherapy, Nursing and Arts Therapy. So what did this assessment look like? In the assessment, students worked in mixed groups on complex patient cases. They did an interprofessional team meeting and they had to write an interprofessional care plan for those patients. They discuss together what they can do, conduct the meeting, and then create an interprofessional care plan. The assessment um, was that they had to reach a summative decision about the interprofessional care plan, so the product of the students, the interprofessional product. And the formative feedback uh, was given the students about their interprofessional process. So in the first redesign, like I said, students were assessed on their interprofessional product, this care plan. And in the slide, you see a short part of the rubrics that we designed to assess the students' interprofessional care plan, in which we focused, for example, on understandable language. Students received feedback on their actions during this team meeting to come to the care plan. And the goal was to assess whether students could interprofessionally write a care plan together. So then what did we do? We had a three experts group who considered whether this assessment could be used to make valid decisions about whether students could collaborati collaboratively write an interprofessional care plan as we intended. These uh, experts were experts in the field of assessment or interprofessional education, teachers and students. And since this assessment was the final one before the students' internships, uh, the experts considered whether this assessment adequately prepared students for the real interprofessional practice, real interprofessional collaboration they would encounter. They also considered whether the various aspects of interprofessional collaboration, for example, the competencies, could be scored with this assessment. The interviews that we did with the experts revealed some strong elements in the assessment, such as the task that was aligned with practice, since professionals in practice often conduct interprofessional team meetings about patients, and they have to create care plans together. A weaker point for improvement was that the assessment presented an idealized version of a team meeting, much more structured than it really goes in, in real practice. A student, for example, sat as a strong point that when you look at rehabilitation, this assessment task matches interprofessional practice because an interprofessional team meeting is organized on a weekly basis. A frequently mentioned weak point of this assessment task was that it only assessed the product and not the collaboration process, which is crucial in practice. One student in particular said that yeah, well, the nursing students started and we just added what we thought per profession. And in the end, you just check if all criteria are included. That is not the interprofessional collaboration we aim for. So to get a better view of assessing the collaboration process of the student team as a whole, 
we redefined the assessment for the fourth and final study. So we redesigned it. So this assessment was similar in setup. So we worked with an interprofessional team meeting, but this time we used a combination of individual preparation and the interprofessional team process as an assessment based on 10 criteria. So we had four interprofessional teams of students from Zuid University and another university in the Netherlands who conducted an interprofessional team meeting. They were assessed, like I said, on individual preparation and their team process, and they were video recording during that assessment. Next, they were assessed by five expert assessors, let's call them, which was followed by a group interview with those, uh, with those assessors to again look at the strong points and the points for improvement of this assessment task. The positive aspects of this assessment included diverse components considered in the assessment, such as individual preparation, the team meeting, the interprofessional care agreements that they still had to make based on the team meeting, and the team reflection as the whole team. A point for improvement was that the collaboration remained still somewhat superficial, with students being able to make long lists of care agreements without needing real collaboration, making it more an addition of all treatments, diagnostics per profession, rather than true collaboration. So we had one assessor who said, when the assignment is to choose the best care agreement, then it becomes a different discussion, because then you can't say, well, we'll do a little bit, bit of this and a little bit of that. So to overview these studies that we did, we saw that these studies highlighted three important points in designing into professional assessment. First, we need careful consideration uh, about what we mean by interprofessional collaboration and what exactly do we want to assess? Because collaboration in an intensive care unit in a hospital looks very different from collaboration in community care. A challenge also, and I think that's also what Jan Jaap referred to, is that Assessing interprofessional competencies can never be separated from assessing monodisciplinary competencies. So we focus mainly on assessing collaboration separately from the expertise of each program, of each educational program. But the knowledge and the skills of each student and of each profession are crucial for good interprofessional collaboration because a nurse without nursing knowledge cannot be a good collaborative partner in a team. But how can we assess both individual and collective expertise. What does it mean for the criteria? What does it mean for the assessors? That's something I would really look forward to, to dive in a little bit more in the future. Also, tasks for assessment should, of course, align with real practice, but interprofessional collaboration does not always happen ideally in practice yet. So education and practice must work very closely together to determine what ideal interprofessional collaboration looks like. And that then will allow for alignment between practice and education, giving students authentic educational and assessment tasks. And speaking of education, last but not least, while this research focuses on assessing interprofessional collaboration, preparation for such assessment is equally important. It's crucial to critically look at the design of interprofessional education tasks as well, ensuring good alignment between what collaboration means so the construct, how it is assessed, and how students are trained to collaborate, how they're educated to collaborate. So the question is no longer if we should prepare students for interprofessional collaboration, but how should we do this? Some final implications uh, from this project is that we must design assessment procedures to ensure positive interdependence between the students, because as we saw, Students have a tendency to work very individually on interprofessional uh, tasks. We have to combine assessment of an end goal with assessment of processes and assess both the individual students as well as the team as a whole. One single assessment or assessment task is insufficient to determine interprofessional competencies because it's such a complex construct and we need to continuously monitor the validity of decisions, especially in education, not just the instruments of assessment. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to, to your questions. And like I said, when you want to uh, receive my dissertation, uh, please send me a message and I will send it to you in September.
Thank you so much, Hester. Another fantastic uh, presentation. And I think something that resonates with everyone, either in, in academia or in a practice setting, how do we authentically assess interprofessional education? And I love the way that you shared that it was an iterative process and that you learned from every stage of, of your PhD. So absolutely wonderful work. So thank you. Um, thank you. Would anyone like to ask Hester a question? Um, we've had some comments in the chat or even um, comments on Hester's work. If you pop your hand up. Oh, Yan Yap, please go. Can't hear you. Uh, thank you very much for sharing. Uh, uh, Hester, it's, it's really great uh, and very important um, research you're doing. Um, I also see, because uh, you were talking about uh, <coughs> um, um, uh, interprofessional education setting, and as you said, that in, in practice there's less uh, interprofessional collaboration. <coughs> Kikri <Kikimakil>. McKill. <coughs> Sorry, it's a dry air. Um, what what would your uh, recommendations be for uh, uh, learning and practice, workplace learning? Yeah, we're dealing with this uh, question at the moment in practice also. So we're looking at this both within education, but also within uh, within practice. And we see that there's a, a bit of a gap of professionals who aren't trained in interprofessional uh, collaboration. So who are working in practice, but need to learn about interprofessional collaboration as well. And I believe that it, it, it's very important to teach the students, but also very important to teach the professionals working in practice and interprofessional collaboration. And we just finished a, a project last year in which we looked at what is needed in the training of professionals for interprofessional collaboration. And in, in this training, we saw that it's, it's very important to first look at the needs of the specific context, because then again, it's it's very similar to the assessment in interprofessional education, as, both as in practice, that we need to look very closely to the setting in which the professionals work. So it has to be aligned towards, are they working in a hospital setting or in a community setting? And next thing, I, I think this is very important, both in education as in practice, is reflection on practice, on collaboration. And, um, to continuously monitor collaboration, to see how we can improve, but also when things go well, that we need to discuss this with each other. What goes well and why? And why do we do this this way? And to continuously reflect on that process. I think it's very important. Fantastic. Thank you. And Kwame has his hand up. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, Hester, thank you for your nice presentation. Um, I'm also looking forward to starting my PhD in October on in interprofessional education. Just a question. Um, so how do you assess students who are not able to join their colleagues during the assessment? So on, on normal modules, uh, they, they have the right to um, defer or request for extension. So if a student were to request for one, how would you manage that as a student? I'm afraid I, I could not hear you uh, very well. Could you maybe repeat the uh, the question? Um, okay, so in normal practice in academia, students have a right to request for extension uh, or mm -hmm. deferral of assessment. So if you had a student from the interprofessional group requesting for one, how would you later assess them? Yeah, yeah, that, that's a very difficult question. And I think that's the difficulty in interprofessional assessment right, right away, you know, because you're dealing with so many students in these interprofessional teams. They all have their different backgrounds. They all have their different strengths. And, and that's what makes it so, so difficult. And um, let me think, this is, this is what we also saw in the interprofessional assessment when we're looking at FAIR assessment, is that when you want to design an assessment task that is very FAIR for all the professions included, then you risk a chance of losing authenticity of the assessment. So that, that's sort of a, a balancing act that you have to do all the time to balance fairness in the assessment with 
authenticity and, and I don't think I have the answer for you but I think it's it's very good to also continuously look at this challenge and to make a choice based on uh, your conversations with students teachers with the prof professionals in practice with patients to make a choice in uh, how you choose to design this assessment Thank you, Kwame, for that um, question. And, and looking in the, the chat, Hester um, had quite a lot of comments from uh, Michael and Kelly. Actually, Kelly's going to be presenting her work in September, where she talks about uni professional uh, preparation for students for IPE. So that's really interesting um, that it follows on beautifully from yours. Mike, did you want to make your comments? No, I, I just already got some information and insights from the chat, so I'm happy about that already. Thank you. Okay, so and any final comments or questions before I round up today's um, presentations? Now, I'll, I'll take the spotlight off you then, Hester. Now, it's not very nice having the spotlight on you. So, okay, so I just want to thank everybody, particularly our two um, amazing presenters uh, today for sharing your work. It, it is truly inspirational to see what's going on, and particularly in the Netherlands. Well done. You're absolutely rocking this. So thank you so much for sharing it, literally at a global level with everybody here from all over the world today, and I'm sure we'll all share with our networks um, so a, a fantastic opportunity for all of us. Um, as I said, um, it's being uh, recorded today, so you can share with your networks um, after the event as well. And I'm just going to put um, in the chat the link to the um, interest.global um, cafe page where you can sign up for our newsletters. You can sign up for future presentations. And also, if you'd like to share your work, um, please sign up uh, to present a cafe. Hopefully you can see it's a really um, nice environment to present in um, and everybody's just so pleased to hear what's happening um, across the world because we're all so invested in, in IPE and, and the difference it can make to um, care and outcomes. So thank you all so much and enjoy the rest of your day, whether it's morning, afternoon or evening. Have a great day, everyone, and take care. Thank you.